Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm an audio geek. I spend about as much time thinking about sounds as most parents do thinking about their kids. Because sounds are beautiful. Sounds are fascinating. On a practical note, sounds form the basis of something called an auditory interface. You're probably familiar with a visual interface, like a computer screen. So an auditory interface lets us connect with technology using our ears rather than our eyes. And that's really, really important for people like train engineers and pilots who need to stay in touch with a lot of complicated machines while keeping their eyes up ahead. When I first learned about that, I thought it was pretty cool that sounds can also help keep us safe. But like I said, I'm an audio geek. Why does any of this matter to you? Well, before long, you or someone you love is going to spend time in a hospital. And when that day comes, there's certain aspects of your comfort and even your safety that can be harmed by bad sounds. Because believe it or not, the today's state-of-the-art medical devices routinely communicate with doctors and nurses using sounds like these. Now that's one beeping mess. If you haven't thought much about the problems with sound designs and medical devices before today, that's probably pretty common. But you should, because you could pay for that bad sound design with your life. Don't believe me? Trust the FDA. They did a survey which showed that over a four-year window, bad sounds led to the deaths of 566 patients. Death by beep? Let me try and explain. The current alarms, for some reason, use sounds that are really annoying. And this leads doctors to turn down the volume or sometimes even turn off the sound so they can concentrate on important issues of patient care. Most of the time, that's not critical. But on some occasions, it leads to deadly consequences. Take this example. Once during a surgery, the doctors needed to temporarily disable the respirator so they could get a clear x-ray image, which sounds scary, but is actually normal in these situations. Unfortunately, they forgot to restart the respirator. And since the alarms were silenced, no one noticed until it was too late, and that patient died. These kinds of stories illustrate the problems with annoying sounds that we tend to silence. But the issue doesn't stop there. Because another problem with the sound annoyance is that we tend to tune out annoying things, particularly when they're happening over and over. So surveys have shown that, on average, hospitals have two critical alarms per day that are missed. Just to put that in context, when you unpack that, across North America alone, we're going to have five million critical misses just this year. The sounds are annoying enough for doctors, but the annoyance issues don't stop there. Because when they bother patients, they prevent them from sleeping, and that extends the time we have to stay in hospitals. That increases the risk of complications and also adds burdens to an already overstretched medical system. So you're probably wondering, if the sounds are really this bad, why do we even use these tones? Why not use speech sounds or like a visual display, like a phone? Well, the thing is, these tone sequences are actually ideally suited for the kinds of complex, real-time information that doctors and nurses need to keep us safe. Relative to speech sounds, they lead to faster recognition, and they also prevent patients from confusion or mis misunderstanding from messages they're not really equipped to get. Now, because they're based on sounds, doctors can keep their eyes where they need to be, for example, on that breathing tube that they're carefully placing down a patient's throat. So rather than why do we use these alarms, the question that keeps me up at night is this. Why does a multi-billion dollar industry, vital to our health and well-being, use sounds no more sophisticated than that dump truck that backs up outside my house every Monday? Part of the problem is really just the name. Because when we call them medical alarms, they sound like they should be annoying and urgent. Things like a fire alarm should be annoying. But a fire alarm goes off rarely. And when it does, you have to act immediately. And that's really the opposite of the situation with these medical alarms. Because we know patients generate hundreds of medical alarms per day. And rarely do they require immediate attention. So rather than compelling urgent action like a fire alarm, they're conveying useful information. They are a quintessential auditory interface. And when we think about it that way, making them annoying, just doesn't help anyone. Now that we've gone over some of the problems with the current device alarms, I want to talk about the solutions. But before we do that, 
I feel like I should let you know something. You see, I'm giving you a lot of medical information here, but I never went to med school. And to be honest, sometimes I pass out when they have to draw blood. And if we're talking about redesigning complicated machines, you should know that sometimes I struggle just assembling my own IKEA furniture. That's why I work with medical professionals to make sure that my interesting acoustic ideas actually make sense in the hospitals you might be in one day. I'm going to give you another scary stat. The Emergency Care Research Institute puts out a list each year of what they see as the top 10 health technology hazards. They've named alarms on this list every year for the past decade, four times in the number one spot. So this is a massive issue, which is why I have amazing colleagues all over the world who are looking at how we can do better. My team focuses on one specific problem here, and you probably guessed based on what I've said up till now, that's the sound annoyance. It's a challenging issue because there's a lot of different factors to consider, but fortunately, we have a secret weapon, and that secret weapon is music. You see, I'm not just an audio geek, I'm a professional musician. And that means I have spent thousands of hours practicing, performing, and even conducting music. I've been privileged to study with some amazing teachers and play alongside incredible musical colleagues who are equally obsessed with good sound. So whether I'm playing a recital or conducting our percussion ensemble, it's my job to recognize good sound when I hear it. And trust me when I tell you, those alarms I played are not good sounds. They make my skin crawl just listening to them for 10 seconds. I can't even imagine how doctors and nurses do that for hours and hours a day when they're making critical life and death decisions about patient care. When I first heard about this problem, I was horrified. And then when I thought about it, I got sort of excited. Because what could be more interesting for a lifelong audio geek than using my musical knowledge to actually save lives? I mean, finally, I can be that acoustic superhero I always dreamed about as a kid. The challenge here, partly, is just that the sounds are annoying. And when you think about it, music is the opposite of annoying. I mean, how many hours a day do you spend listening to music? Music proves that it's at least possible to design complex streams of sound in a way that isn't so aversive. And when you think about it, as a musician, trying to design sound in a way that's not annoying is a pretty low bar but it's not a bad place to start, and that's how I got involved. So now I want to show you what we're doing to try and help with this problem. Biologists will use a microscope to show the complexity in things that might seem simple on the surface. So we're going to do that now with a simple sound. And when we deconstruct this simple individual note from a violin, you can actually see there's a world of complexity. All the components are moving, sort of doing their own thing, but also somewhat in synchrony. It's like they're part of a team. It's beautiful. Sorry, I warned you I'm an audio geek. I've analyzed a lot of sounds like this. And I can tell you, it's not just the violin. All musical sounds are complex. So in contrast to this, let's see what those medical device sounds look like. As you can see, here they're sort of taking a very different approach. All the components start and end at the same time. There's very little temporal variation. It looks nice in that figure, but it sounds awful. So what I can't help but wonder about is this. If we know the beeps sound bad, and we know music sounds good, and musicians like complex sounds, why is it that medical device manufacturers consistently go in the exact opposite direction? The more that I thought about it, I realized there's two parts here. The first issue is just historical. In the early days of these machines, beeps were all we had. So they became what we expected the machines to sound like, and no one ever really expected them to sound any different. Now, a lot of medical technology has advanced incredibly over the past several decades. So why is it that the sounds are stuck in the past? This, I think, reflects in part a terrible misunderstanding of what's important in an auditory experiment and an auditory interface. It's sort of a mouthful, so let me unpack that. My team surveyed over 1,000 auditory experiments in top journals, and we found that most use simple sounds similar to those ones I just showed you. But the thing is, what matters in an experiment is often the precision, controlling the exact duration of that tone. Researchers don't usually care about aesthetics. I mean, no one ever signs up for an experiment for a fun night out. So in the lab, we're not concerned about annoyance. But those experiments last for about an hour, and that's shorter than any hospital visit that I've ever had. 
So the things that are helpful for an auditory experiment, like precise control over the sound, don't matter in a hospital. But what matters is the fact that these sounds are annoying the bejesus out of everyone. So we've gotten here through this two-part double whammy. Unfortunately, this misguided belief in the virtues of sonic simplicity has led us to overlook the fact that the engineering limitations that got us to the beeps to start with no longer apply. This brings us to a terrible sonic situations in hospitals all over the world. But music shows us a better path. Every time Yo-Yo Ma draws that bow across a cello string, every time Adele fills an arena with her voice, musicians viscerally demonstrate the power of good sound. This shocking slash painfully obvious insight that the quality of sound matters in auditory interfaces is actually a driving force in my team's research. Some of our experiments manipulate the current alarm sounds, sort of massaging each tone, making each note more complex, more musical. We don't change the pitches or the rhythms, so doctors who know the old alarms will recognize the new ones immediately. But there is one difference, and that difference is really important if you're listening to these for hours on end. Because we find over and over, in many experiments, participants consistently rate the new sounds as less annoying than the old ones. Think about it this way. Rather than those beeps I played for you before, you could now be surrounded by sounds that are like quick musical gestures. And which would you prefer if you're in the hospital for a week trying to recover, or if your elderly parent needed to rest after surgery, or your newborn desperately needed sleep? What if you had to monitor these sounds for hours a day, which is simply part of the job for anesthesiologists all over? If I'm sedated while going under the knife, I want to do everything possible to minimize the annoyance and maximize the concentration of the person in charge of waking me up. Wouldn't you? I've thrown out a lot of scary thoughts today, so I want to transition now to a more hopeful note because I'm really excited by the fact that hospitals the world over are filled with these medical devices. Because you see, even small benefits can be leveraged into major gains for public health. Now, a lot of the changes are gonna be costly or difficult or challenging, but there's one that's as cost efficient as it is straightforward as it is simple. And so I'm standing here today begging the medical device industry, please fix the sounds. If you remember only one thing from this talk, please make sure it's this. Bad sound design costs lives. And for every unfortunate death by beep, there's patients out there taking longer to recover than they should be. Burned out doctors more exhausted than they need to be, all because the sounds have been designed more annoyingly than they have to be. I hope the next poorly designed beep that you hear is not in a hospital, but just from a truck backing up or at an ATM or at a supermarket checkout counter. Because if I've done my job here today, that annoying sound is gonna remind you of me. And that's okay. I'm fine with that. I'm happy even. I just hope that if you remember this talk, you'll take a moment and wonder, what can I do to help us get to a better sounding world? Because the answer to that question just might be the most surprising thing you've heard from me today. If you're interested in saving lives, improving public health, and advancing the state of this multi-billion dollar industry, then what you need to do is support the arts. Pick up an instrument, join a band, and if performing isn't your thing, check out a concert. You're guaranteed to have a good time. Because I'm convinced that some of the most important and innovative new insights to this complex public health problem positioned right at the intersection of engineering and medicine just might come from listening a little more carefully to music. Thank you.